officially live. Great. Right. Um, like Chris said, um, thanks so much for coming, everyone. We really do appreciate it. We're excited to have some representation from the East Coast. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started with panel conversation. So, um, similar to Chris, I'm also a student advisor here at Springboard. Um, and yeah, we have three awesome panelists today. So, we're just going to go ahead and go in order if you guys want to say your names, um, what you do with Springboard, and um, yeah, what, what you're doing here today. Sure. So, uh, my name is Richard Wolf. Um, I am an alumni, I graduated in June. I am a data scientist at AJ Madison, uh, optimizing a lot of their appliance sales and marketing. Um, and I am here because I love data scientists. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is David Jakobovich. I've been a mentor for Springboard since October 2017. I worked with over 25 students so far, all of them getting different jobs in data science and data engineering throughout the United States. Uh, my day by day, what I work on is doing infrastructure for companies like Autodesk, Salesforce, USA, Charles Schwab, and Invesco, where I support in AI, data science, and microservices. And here to help you know, share some more insights for you guys, got one of my students here. Hey, Andrew, thanks for joining us here today. <laughs> all right, um, I'm Allison. And I'm a career coach with the science um, career track program. And um, so I am, I guess I'm here because I really like uh, getting to see the students in person. It's always really exciting to see everybody from like you're up. Um, so it's nice <laughs> to actually interact. Um, that's always, always a bonus. Um, and I'm going to say Great. Thank you, guys. Awesome. So let's start off um, just ranking things. How did you guys become a data scientist, or what initially brought you to data science? Sure. So um, it's, it's a long history. So I started out in marketing. I always thought I would be an ad man uh, back when Mad Men was on TV. <laughs> that was a cool thing to do. Um, uh, quickly realized that that wasn't going to be a thing, and I started in sales. I took to finding the edge in the sales data that we had. And really, it was very simple Excel stuff, but no one was doing that at our company at the time. Uh, our national account started sending us some of their point of sale information, and, and I was the one that was heralded as the person that could drive that in. Um, I thought I was biting off more than I could chew, but you know, as you start learning about how to use some of these different formulations and, and modeling the phenomenon in Excel, you quickly learn that it's not enough and you need to learn something else. So I started training myself in Python and continued to grow from like a sales, sales analyst to a full-time analyst. And then finally into uh, a data analyst or a senior insights analyst uh, at Tempur-Pedic. Um, kind of hit a ceiling there, but I wanted to drive that a little further, so I took the data science career track, um, which was a logical next step, I felt, uh, from where I was. Um, and then I am wearing it. Awesome. My story is also a little bit of a journey, if you will. Um, back in 2010, when I was studying business and mathematics, I was trained to be an actuary. And my first job was with AFLAC in loss experience monitoring. And this is before the term data science was even out there. This is 2010. This is before deep learning was even occurring um, at Google, right? So, so back in 2010, I was coding in Fortran, Cobalt, and C Sharp uh, for uh, AFLAC. And they were starting to talk about data and big data. And I said, let me, let me think about this. So from 2010 to 2015 was my journey from actuarial to data scientist. So I moved into financial control, business intelligence, data analytics, scrum master, project manager, dashboarding, and advanced predictive analytics into data science, what we call it today. It's been a journey over many companies in the FinTech world uh, into 2015, where then I started moving more into AI. So now I'm also very much in that space, which has been a journey for the past four years as well. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about this industry is if you like to learn, you can keep learning each and every day for the rest of your life. There are now, um, every month, more than 6% of the machine learning papers that exist in history are being published every month. That's how fast this industry is growing and changing right now. You can go on archive and see a lot of those papers. So it's a great industry to learn. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 I no, yeah, and I think something else that you can also speak to is just the fact that a lot of our students and you both alike um, get into data science in kind of their own organic way. They all come from different and diverse backgrounds, which is really nice because I think that also brings an edge to it a little bit as well. You're able to apply your background to data science. Um, so I think that's really cool. 
or apply data science to your background. To your background, exactly. Um, yeah. So I got a question for David. Um, so with you know, I, I know how I deal with the feeling of not being able to keep up, and, and, you know, not even really say five percent of the articles being produced. Right. Um, you know, how how can some of the students out here or myself feel like we are able to keep up with what's going on and how fast? You know, as, as an individual um, in the industry who's both taught, mentored, and actually practiced data science, the number one thing I can say for you to stay current is to be coding each and every day. It really does come about putting in the time into your work. Uh, if you stop coding, you're not able to look at these new research and these new trends and to be a part of that. Uh, sure, you can do different applications. We're seeing automated solutions today from the big players like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. But it's coding each and every day. Um, I could recommend listservs and blogs you to sign up with, but then you're just going to get inundated with information. You know, I think just the best thing: code each day. And if there's one thing you want to do, then to, to do that coding, rather than signing up to all these listservs, go into GitHub and pick the language you're learning. If that language is Python for the majority of this room, sort daily. It's actually, I, I can find a link later, but it's that you can see the weekly most starred repositories on GitHub from every language. Um, I'll have to find that link, but it's really great to see what are those, what are those 10 new Python ones, and then play around with them. New algorithms, it's, it's practical. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great kind of hashtag, code every day. Let's, yeah. let's make that <laughs> and then New York meetup. That's right. Great. Um, I guess speaking to your guys' journey to the beginning, and like the beginning of the, the introduction that you had to data science, is there anything that you would have done differently? or any tips or tricks that you might have for students who are just starting or maybe who have just joined our courses? So for me, I, when I started my journey, I uh, started to go to a couple of meetups, uh, data science meetups, and I kind of fell off that wagon. I wish I would have stuck with that and, and have been in person for some of these events a, uh, a lot more often. Uh, that is the one thing that I would recommend, is make sure you get in front of, face-to-face uh, -face with other data scientists that are in the field doing the work and, and learn from them work on projects with them and, and, and kind of use their expertise to help you grow. Well, you provide value to them by helping them with some of their projects as well. I'll, I'll first second what he just mentioned, and then I'll share the point I'm going to say as well, is you are as strong as your network, right? It doesn't hurt to start relationships a year, two years, five years in advance that you need them. Uh, a great example is one of my friends from high school. This is now dating myself so much, but um, we go back a long time. And for a different cause, nothing to do with tech or startups, we met together this summer in Washington, D.C., March for Our Lives. We're both organizers for that movement. And well, ended up being that, well, he's running Halcyon House in D.C., the number one nonprofit, you know, startup space. And I was doing some work with Angel Hack, and it's just minds coming together. I don't look at this LinkedIn every day to know that, but we found out, wow, how cool, how can we work together? So I totally agree. As powerful as your network, meet people today every single day. Um, okay, so what's my point I want to share, if, if that one thing you can do every day, with your mentors as you're in this program, ask questions, ask as many questions as you want, challenging as it is, it's fine. For you it might seem insurmountable, um, but I'm here to help, and your mentors are here to help, and we want you to be successful, whether it's career advice, whether it's coding, how to break down a function, ask the questions, keep asking them, email me throughout the week, I want to be here to support you, we're all here for your success. I would say, yeah, I would just say to piggyback on that is, I think that there's kind of two, obviously, I love you guys are waving the networking flag. <laughs> so, because um, I think it's one thing that a lot of people have trepidation, um, but I can tell you it's, once people do, you know, an informational interview call, say they're not local, or you meet them in person, or you slowly ease your way into feeling comfortable with networking, you know, it doesn't have to be a, you're, you know, you know, slinging, getting millions of phone numbers, you know, and uh, LinkedIn connections every meetup you go to, you know, it can be incremental, you can grow with it, you know, and one good connection is better than, you know, 20 sometimes. Um, and uh, just speaking to the, you know, meeting people from so many years back and staying in touch with people, you know, it's not that you need to email them every week to keep them in your network, it's, you know, every few months or something, or remember what you spoke about with them last, follow up with an article you think they might be interested in, just really more authentic kind of genuine ways of following up, not where it's kind of pouncing. Um, and then I think one thing too is you have career and technical resources for you know a lot of the career things that you do through the curriculum. And you know I think that a lot of the times it seems siloed that oh can we get experience from this person for this and this person for this. But 
why not have two people and then you can, you know, assess out, you know, maybe in more detail with the career coach or whatever. But, um, you know, I always love hearing what, you know, the technical side is saying, just so that I can make sure that I'm calibrating as well. Um, and that you kind of are making the decisions for yourself um, about how you want to bring in yourself and your experience and things like that. And that is really important so that it's kind of your decision, but you're getting, you're getting both data points <laughs> um, so that you can kind of, um, you know, utilize all that information and leverage it. Yeah, and I think speaking to just like our online platform in general, there are two really great ways to network to some extent. I think one of that is through our community. So I know a lot of you, you are at an online portal and I think through the community you can also, you know, meet other students who might be in your area or who might, who might be nearby that might not be, you know, an exact networking event like tonight. But just I think the community is one really great way to play into the networks that you might have currently. Alongside that, we do host office hours every Thursday. Chris and I um, host alongside um, some really great mentors who join us as well. But I think that's another way um, just to kind of see the community that you're working alongside and to really reach out to those contacts then. So I um, really urge you, if you haven't already, to look into those two direct options that we have as well. Um, so I guess moving, speaking of like the networking options in general, do either of you and Allison do as well have any really great networking events that you've been at before or that you, like a platform that you've used to meet other data scientists? I went to one, like I said, I went to some meetups early on in the process and kind of fell off the wagon. I, I went to a couple of meetups. Um, and they, I think it was the Data Science meetup, I think right. is what it was called. And I've met uh, two folks there who were going to school actually at Stevens for the Data Science Master's program. Um, and, and that was a good opportunity to meet those people. Um, as far as other networking events, I haven't really taken part in much. I've, you know, worked with my mentor a lot, and he's introduced me to other mentors and other folks in that part of the program. Um, so I guess other than networking events and other opportunities, just really working those networks that you already have uh, to, to help you out with, with uh, extending that network as well. Don't be afraid to talk to anyone that shows even the slightest sign of, of um, affinity for what you do or, or wants to work in, in the data science world. I was on a flight going to Kentucky, and I saw someone with uh, how to automate the boring stuff in Python. <laughs> I struck up a conversation with him, and, and mm -hmm. we worked on a, on a little project for, to help get him up to uh, faster speed from where he was. He was just in finance and wanted to kind of uh, get into that exploratory data analysis type of world. So speak to everyone about it if, if they show signs of liking it. And Wear t-shirts and say, I love you a science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On air, You'll make a lot of sense. <laughs> I would say also, I remember Rich said like one really kind of like creative thing when he was networking, which was you were listening to a podcast oh, yes, yes. and he ended up getting to have coffee with like the director of data scientists at Pinterest. Etsy. Etsy, Etsy, yes. sorry, sorry. Um, Don't so be I afraid was, to reach out. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually used that example, maybe with some of you, um, but it's like, hey, if you're listening to things, if you're out there, like, don't be, if you don't ask, you don't know. It's going to happen. So I would just say that's where it's kind of going to be scrappy and creative because if you're doing something that other people aren't doing, that's you know that's usually your odds are a little lower. <laughs> so that's always always helpful too. And for those of you who are looking at startups, it's no longer uncommon to think that startups are only in San Francisco and the Bay Area. New York's the number two startup capital in the U.S. And a ton of these startups will invite you for free lunch on Thursdays or Fridays with their team, with the data scientists. So you can reach out, have free lunch, have coffee, go to their happy hours. It's just like the Bay Area. Um, if I have any prediction um, in the next 10 years, I'll echo Fred Wilson. I think New York's gonna be the number one tech startup hub in the US. Obviously Amazon's bringing you know, 25,000 jobs. Google's bringing another 15,000. You know, we see a lot of startups growing really fast right now. Um, you know, what are ways that you can network and get out there more? Of course, you can go to Meetup, which is now part of the WeWork family, and that helps a lot as well. Um, but beyond that, um, since we're almost in New Yorkers or New Jerseyans here today, sorry my Californians. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my favorite guys is Gary. If you guys know Gary's Guide, if you're not on Gary's Guide yet, check out Gary's Guide. It's free. You can, you can sign up every week. Gary, um, he's in when it really kicked off after 9-11, it's when tech really kicked off here. Um, and uh, free events, paid events, all that, they're all, um, you know, gathered together there, and it's really great. Um, you can sign up for, again, tons of listservs, but Gary's got it's good enough. You'll find most of your events there. I would say also, um, I think that there's a built-in 
New York City. Oh, those are NYC. Right? Yeah, so those are, and they've got a great interface with them for when they're talking to. They're kind of the ones, one of the ones I really like. And they usually have events. And there's also American Inno, which is in like cities. They kind of pick um, like every city but San Francisco, <laughs> um, which I think is kind of funny. Um, I'm based in Boston, so it's kind of nice to have something in Boston, which is, uh, you know, not, not always seen as a tech hub. It seems like where a lot of them come from, but not always where they stay. So <laughs> um, that's where I'd say those two sites are what I send to people a lot, um, you know, in very kind of cities, but I know in New York it's been really helpful. Um, for also just identifying new companies, too. Also, there's a Boston based firm, uh, Venture Pits, uh, that just opened. Just started doing things in New York City and has been trying to build kind of a presence here as well. Um, they also have like a job alert type thing. They also list events and stuff like that. And they actually do pretty comprehensive jobs and that stuff. To, to add on to what Allison was sharing, also for these events and these meetups, most of these meetups are sponsored and they're mostly sponsored by companies. Startups are big companies and there's almost always recruiters at these events <laughs> and they want to hire. Um, there's almost 400,000 jobs in tech that are right now unfulfilled in New York City which is really crazy that they just can't be fulfilled. In data science alone, there's over 3,000 active jobs right now that cannot be filled. There's just not enough talent. So it's like all of you can be working in these jobs and they're opening every single month. So, um, you know, attend events. I wouldn't say go to 20 a week, then you're not spending time studying and, and learning and growing your craft. But, you know, if you can get to two or three a week, I think that would be a win. And I guess we're gonna kind of now move to the interview process and then go to like, it actually is led to be a data scientist. So I guess, Allison, this might be a little more direct to you, but in which I'd love to get your guys' input as well. Um, in the interview process, what differentiates a candidate from being a great candidate to just a nearly all right or good candidate? Um, I know for my like recruiting experience, the big thing for me was always communication. So if they got back to me quickly, gave me what I needed, I knew where they were, they let me know if they were working with other companies, and it wasn't just me. I know sometimes people don't want to tell agency recruiters, where they work interviewing because those people are trying to get leads. <laughs> um, but if it's a corporate recruiter, so somebody that works directly at a company, um, they're not trying to get leads. They're just trying to figure out where you're at in the process, how interested you are. Because they're investing, you know, if you think about their time, that's an hourly wage the company's paying. So every hour they spend working with you, you know, they're investing that money. The more they spend, the more invested they are. It's kind of like when you know car salesman tries to keep you in their locker. Um, so they feel more like you have to buy it. I think that's not good. Um, but, uh, not this old. Uh, but you know, those are the types of things where I think a lot of the times it's the communication and then in that the key is follow-up. Don't expect a recruiter is going to get back to you. 99% um, of the time you need to follow up. Um, it is not going to be where it's on them. It's you're the one that's trying to move the process forward and they can have a lot of things going on in the background that are really out of their control. I can tell you that I've had hiring managers for a year for three weeks and I have to wait till <laughs> um, so, you know, and not all recruiters are great at communicating that. Um, so it's good to follow up, but also, you know, not, not following up too aggressively. You're just communicating those things. If you do have concerns, communicating them in a very, you know, calm, kind of rational way. Always good to not be accusatory. <laughs> um, because they're, you want them on your side. They're the ones that are going to advocate for you to the hiring manager. If they really like you, they're going to try and make you happy. Um, so there is a little bit of a sales game. It's always good to remember when you're interviewing, you are selling. Um, and I know a lot of the times when you're in tech, you're like, well, I went into tech because I didn't want to be a salesperson. Um, but, you know, hey, if you're trying to get a job and that's the goal, it's kind of sometimes you have to do things that are out of your comfort zone and make that happen. I want to add some additional comments to what Allison shared. So, first off, she's way more experienced with recruiting than probably anyone in this room. She's really experienced there. So, always feel free to ask her more questions. She's done great work, particularly in the tech space. Um, uh, I also do some recruiting. I've done some. I've been chief of staff at a couple companies. So, um, and particularly at one of the organizations I work at right now, every week I am actively interviewing data engineer candidates, data science candidates, and full stack developer candidates. So, I want to echo what she's saying in that um, people at companies are so busy, and right now it's not always been out of office. It's not annoying for you to follow up with us. We never think it's annoying. We just forget it falls down our priorities. We're just not. You're not number one for us because we have so much going on. You might still be the number one candidate. So follow up until we tell you no or leave me alone. Keep following up. That's pretty much, that's pretty much what it is, right? Um, and then secondly, you know, in an interview process, I do agree that you know, communication is very important, but also it is coding, right? So um, any sort of role you're going to apply for will have some sort of code interview in 2018. 
and often they start with a remote code interview on one of these softwares. You can name a dozen companies now that all have it. Um, you know, CoderPad is one of the standard ones that you'll see out there, um, where you're working with an engineer like myself who will be guiding you through several questions and seeing how well do you code. I want to know two things. One, can you talk and not just be radio silent? Can you please explain what you're doing, how you're coding, your thought process? All my questions, I don't always care for the right answer. I want to know your thought process. How inquisitive are you? How problem solving are you? But then sometimes it also is, can you actually solve this code? Um, most interviews you'll be on that require live coding, these one hours in remote or in person. It's not meant to all be solved in an hour. We're just trying to see like how far can you make it along and of course, the better you do, the better your chances to move on to the next stage of the interview. So the reason I share all that is this goes back to my point earlier, code every single day. Right? Code every single day, even if it's just an hour. Uh, sure, you can check out these other code sites and all these things, but predominantly that's Python and data science to get you familiar. I would add on, after you're done with the course and you've learned everything you've learned, be confident in what you know. Uh, don't don't feel like you're an imposter. Don't let that kick in, especially during the interview, because that, that could that could set off uh, the, the wrong vibe for the recruiter. So feel confident. You've done the work. You you, you have great capstones. I think just believe in yourself and, and the work through the process. Definitely. I think two two takeaways: now code every day, and then also just keep reaching out until they say no. That's the fun. <laughs> <laughs> I have one like follow up question to that. So I get a lot of um, students that struggle with the time. So a lot of like kind of entry level type data science or data analytics roles have a coded like SQL or Python test. And I think a lot of the times, you know, not it's maybe been a while since some of us have had, you know, the Scantron, you know, like time <laughs> tests or things like that, you know. Yes, I still have my hands up the But um, you know, are there any resources where people can practice like a timed test just so that that because sometimes it's not the skill, it's the timing. Just like yeah, you know, sure. knowing that there's a clock clicking, you know, a, a clock ticking down. So what I will say is that there are sites where you can customize those time tests, um, particularly um, on my GitHub, we can share that with AI, my David's Python data science resources that I share with all the students, like, like Andrew knows, and I put some of the code sites there. Um, code Wars is one of my favorite ones because they're really hard questions, so you get to work in base Python and be really good. They're not all timed, but I would say, why not simulate that environment? Simulate a 60-minute environment Typically during 60 minutes, you're going to get three questions. In most data science interviews, you're going to have to start out with something in base level Python. You're always going to have something. You don't have the packages. Does this person actually know how to build this from scratch? Whatever it's going to be. Then there'll typically be some sort of data science code that you'll recreate or edit or debug or whatnot. Um, and then there'll be um, some error in a third uh, question that's more complex that there's no right answer and they just want to see that process. That's typically what it could look like. It can vary, but um, you, you can simulate that environment for yourself. Those are really great resources. Thank you for sharing that. And I think just like to summarize, and if I'm understanding this correctly, it's not only to be able to code, but to be also able to explain what you're doing and explain your thought process. I think from what I've heard in the past, a lot of the times, if you're unable to explain to people who might not be in that tech background or in that data background, they won't be able to understand what you're going through or what you're doing. And so being able to have that communicative language, um, those soft skills to be able to I want to add that you know I'm not a full stack engineer by trade, but sometimes I intentionally interview full stack uh, candidates with another one of our full stack engineers just to see oh can I actually understand what they're trying to do? Are they actually explaining well, or if it's so bad you know I can't understand it, no business person is going to understand it. So um, you always want to assume whoever is interviewing you could be that non technical manager who's just really trying to see is is this person a culture fit? Do they explain things well? So, and I say a gateway question for that is in your phone screen when they say tell me about yourself. If you ramble and can't really, you know, get to a point and it's not well thought out and prepared, they're just gonna think, oh, the recruiter, that's they're not technical, but they do know the soft skills. And that's gonna be the one where they're gonna be like, well, they were, you know, had a lot of good experience, but we should watch this. And so that's where it's always good to, you know, that's why I think a lot of times the behavioral questions aren't important, but a lot of that is, it's, you know, giving examples of, of those types of skills so that then they feel confident bringing you to the next round where, um, you know, you can, you know, show how you bring those two things together. I'd like to add on to, for the coding test, one thing that may be helpful, which definitely helpful for me, 
go to YouTube, search uh, coding tests done by Google or Amazon or, or any of the tech companies, they'll put those out there and, and you'll get to experience someone else going through it and, and kind of get a vibe for what some of these recruiters might be looking for on, on especially on, on a Google level, but um, it'll help prepare you mentally for what you'll see on, on, on any level. It's good to open from here because then it seems easier when you're doing it. <laughs> and one other thing I'll add is that when you're doing, especially the remote one, People often assume the only thing open on my screen is this, I can't reference anything. Not true. You're welcome to reference documentation, Stack Overflow, whatnot. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can always ask the interviewer, oh, can I reference some material? And I see nine out of 10 times people say, sure, that's fine. Then just talk to us through your process as well. As long as you're not just copying and pasting code, but you're, you know, in the real workflow, you're constantly learning. And I think kind of last question regarding the interview process before we move on to questions from the audience as well. Um, in, in regards to like the portfolio versus the resume, do you guys have any tips or tricks on what to bring to an interview? And if you do choose one or the other, what should that entail and what should that include? Yes, bring both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it depends on what the company's most interested in as well. So for me, I, I went down a path of a business oriented role where we use modeling apply to business scenarios, not so much the, the deep learning and, and machine learning side of things, but we do use that once in a while. So uh, for me, the portfolio wasn't as important, but being able to show that I've worked through business some problems in the past was, so the resume was a little more important, uh, but I think it depends on, on the interview, the company, and, and what you're going for. And part of it's also your background, right? Some of you already come from data analyst, software engineers, so you'll have a more smooth transition into a data science role. Some of you come more from that business background, you're relying heavier on these two capstones for the portfolio. So it's important that you can explain the business results that you've achieved, um, especially if you don't have that industry experience, because then everything is reliant on these capstones. Can you walk me fully through that data science workflow? Can I understand the complexity of the problem, the complexity of your methodologies, the complexity of the algorithms, and how nuanced can you speak to this? And the more that you, again, uh, I think both of you said before sound confident, I'm confident that you're confident. I think we're ready to move on to that next stage. So I'd say um, usually with you know when I work with students, I'm going to have them. Your GitHub link is always going to be everywhere. <laughs> um, I think if anybody's worked with me, you have it in your in your LinkedIn, probably five different places. Um, you should never know where somebody's going to look. Um, but with the resume, I think the big thing is realizing how somebody's going to look at it. No one is going to painstakingly read and highlight. For all the things that you check off the list. Um, I know when I was with recruiters, we literally do look at it for 20 seconds. Um, so that's not a mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and yeah, oh, no, definitely. I used to, yeah, I mean, if I was recruiting 150 positions in a year, I mean, think of, you know, think how many people you go through for that, and then you're trying to, um, you know, get that many people in. So, and then you have to interview these people, get other people to look at them. So, the main thing you want to do is can your resume be scanned? That is the biggest thing. So you should have bullet points, not long paragraphs, because recruiters will not read a paragraph. Um, they will only read bullet points. You don't want to do gimmicky things like highlight keywords in your resume. Don't do anything gimmicky because then they get suspicious right off the bat. The main thing is that you want to have, I usually explain it to people that it should be referential. You should be able to go where it's, okay, if you need a summary statement, especially if you're transitioning careers, there should be some sort of thing, but it should be a salesy statement a little bit, which should be very, Condensed and like me. Um, and then you should have your skills, and they should be organized very well to where people understand the languages, software packages, if you're, you know, advanced in statistics, you know, have a statistics section where you're listing things out. But if it's not listed out in, in, in subjects or, you know, specializations, I can't scan it. If you're just doing this long list of things, I'm honestly going to catch the first three and maybe the last two. Because um, recruiter speed. So you do want to make sure that those things are there. And then if you're not, kind of to your point is, in your projects, if you're not sharing the result or the outcome of your project, it's kind of a waste. Um, so you want to make sure there's the objective. You want to share how much data or what this kind of size and scope of what you were doing was. You want to share the technical tools that you used in order to conduct the analysis and who the results. Because why would you do all that hard work and not share if somebody not turned out? Um, and if you do that, I can tell you as a non-technical person, I would understand what you worked on, or I would be able to extract the information that was important for me to decide whether or not you looked legit, or I could send you to my manager and I could Because recruiters care about looking good. 
Okay, well, we would love to actually open this up now. Um, I have a lot more questions I can ask. We'd love to take questions, though, from the audience, as well as Facebook Live. I know um, some students are watching virtually as well. But um, start off by hand raise if anyone has some great questions at the top of their head. Yeah, we also want to see what I also mentioned uh, creating a brand. And then we have some questions of ultimate. Maybe we could a little bit more about to uh, create your online brand. It also has a question about the recruiters in terms of why I had someone call me two years ago and what happens if you have this job? It's like, it's your birthday, it's security, and <laughs> yeah, so um, I just, let's really quick oh. say the question just allows. So yeah, yeah. So the question was first about kind of branding and your digital footprint, like as your brand name for your job. So I would say like LinkedIn or if you're doing, if you tweet or, you know, anything like that, you want to keep those things on brand. Don't ever think that a company is not going to look at your social media. That would be the first thing. Um, I know a lot of recruiters who go to Facebook. No, on your social media, I will always Google your full name and then I will put in quotes and see where you've been around just to see that you're a normal person. Right? So, so, yeah, otherwise, yeah. Okay, HR can't say that. But. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, that's retracted. <laughs> but but you do look, I've had companies not hire someone because the person used like foul language in their tweets. Um, they were just using the F word and they were like, sorry. Um, so, be, you know, you do want to be cautious of those things. Um, uh, and uh, maybe Gary Manner just hire that person instead. Yes. But, <laughs> but um, and then for, sorry, for the digital footprint, um, the main thing is that, you know, with LinkedIn, you want to make sure that whenever you're creating things that recruiters are going to look at and maybe cross-reference, you want to make sure dates match up, titles match up, job, the, everything, those types of things that there aren't weird gaps that you're trying to play around with. You're better off just being completely authentic, genuine, and honest, and then having a really well thought out response for, hey, why do you have a three month gap? Oh, well, you know, actually, I decided to leave my job. I have been taking this course, and I wanted to, you know, take the time to, you know, really put all of my energy into becoming a pastor. You know, something like that, where, it, you know, it's not, wasn't this just, well, I wanted to go for it. You know, so it's actually, you know, a thoughtful response. But I would say, if you're trying to just put that on paper, the biggest thing is you want to make sure that people, when they look at your LinkedIn or your resume, don't have any context. They don't know you. They've never. They may not know the company you work for. It could be the recruiter just got put on a data science job and they have no clue what they're looking at. So that's where you want to make sure that you're not so detailed that they can't see everything. But the most relevant bullet points that you have should be at the top. Of every job description. And in your summary, the main thing I the main tip I tell everyone is you need to figure out, explain to me how you got from point A to point B, like where you started, maybe where you studied or where you've been the past few years. How did you get where you are now? What was that catalyst that made you want to get into data science? Because then I can, as a human, connect with you on that. Like, oh, I've had a moment in my life where I thought, oh, I need to do that. You know, it makes me also want to like cheer for you, learn more. Um, so that's, you know, that can be a big thing where you can kind of create your brand that way. Also, you don't want to try and be everything to everybody. You know, so you, you need to think of, hey, these are the, this is my background, these are the skills, this is how I'm going to spin it, this is how I'm going to sell it, and this is going to be, you know, this can be a good fit for me. Um, and, and that's really important to kind of think of, you know, what's my edge? You know, my domain experience, my industry knowledge, that can be my leverage, and then I've got these new skills. How do I combine those two to sell it to somebody, to make them think that I've got something that um, to the recruiter question, well, one asking you for your social security number is a scam. <laughs> um, so don't ever give anyone your social security number over the phone. I think that's maybe just like a rule of thumb. Um, but um, when agency recruiters call, it's usually the sky is falling and they you are they need to send your resume right now um, because they work like this. They're filling jobs. They're competing against ten other people in their office to fill it, and they're commission based. So they want to fill it. If you don't send them your resume within like 30 minutes to an hour of when they call you, you're probably not going to get sent to the position. Um, I will say I send some people to tech systems sometimes. They used to work for their sister company, and nobody's given me bad news yet that they have a really bad experience with them. So if you're looking to work with a recruiting agency, 
I would say go and just call their local office and say, hey, do you have any, any recruiters that work with data scientists? If you're looking to work with an agency, the main thing you want to do with an agency recruiter is ask them these three questions. Um, do you have a job description? Have you ever filled a position with this company before? And can you, like, what, um, is there an interview process or how, when are you expecting to be sending them applications? If you ask them those three questions, they're going to know they can't really trust with you too much. Um, so I would say those are really important things. But don't feel like you have to get back to every recruiter. If they're responding to you with, with like, ridiculous jobs that make no sense for you, you can say thanks but no thanks or you can just leave the message. If it's somebody that is relevant or you think they might be legit, look up the recruiting company that's in their letterhead first um, and then, you know, find them on LinkedIn and then see, see if they make sense. Oh no! Medium articles, medium articles end up being um, what I have a lot of students do, or just be like active on LinkedIn, sharing things in your feed, commenting on what other people are doing. I would say on LinkedIn, people, like, people are so nice. Yeah. On the data science industry, I will say like nobody badmouths anybody because um, software engineering is very different. Um, people so underrate like, LinkedIn. I mean, like you can do a medium post, but like medium has paywalls and it's kind of weird. And I mean, they're cool, but they're weird. So like LinkedIn, it's it's there, right? And you know, you get to connect with people and comment on posts. And yeah, it's a great culture. You get to link directly to your GitHub, some of the work that you've done, and, and it's it's there on a on a timeline for other people to see instead of writing blog posts, sending it to LinkedIn, then they go to the blog posts, then they gotta get to your GitHub. It's a lot less. There's a few steps to that. Point. So definitely underutilized. And, uh, yeah. No, but there's a girl on, uh, her name's Kate, and I'm, her last name is really hard to pronounce, like Stretch Me or something. Stretch. And uh, she does humans of data science, like vlog type things. Um, and she, so I would say those are great. She basically interviews data scientists um, in like all the videos they talk about what they do. So I would say that also can be like following those types of things, and then maybe seeing if you can connect with that data scientist and follow them different things like that where you can start commenting on those and getting connected with people. Great question. Thanks so much, Greg. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Last time. One thing about your yes, salary. salary. This is a very New York specific thing. There was a law passed in New York City, so I'm here in New York. Um, oh, Boston too. Where so, they can't necessarily use your past salary and keep that in mind to determine your current salary to encourage pay equity and not pay discrimination. So Probably recruiters should not be asking you for a New York City job. What was your past salary? So I'll add to what Julie's asking as someone who oh, hires right, in yeah. New York. Oh, I was just uh, no, no, I actually know also. So this passed in November 2017. It's just for New York State. It's not for New Jersey. It's for nowhere else. But I can still ask you whatever question, but you're not required to respond, and I can't penalize you for not responding. So instead, here's a great question recruiters should ask. What are your salary and expectations? Thank in general, and own. then uh, you could always decline that and say, you know, what is the compensation control? And then it's a back and forth cat game sometimes, yeah. or then you're just like, oh, commensurate with experience. It seems that this role and my experience would pay, you know, 90 to 120. You know, then you could give yourself definitely, a range. Definitely do the research on yeah. the role that they have and yeah. or exactly. and then you have a number go off if it's not your salary. Also, right. pay scale is pretty good too. Yes. So, you don't want to use one source. Um, I think also, like, people will be like, oh, I want on CNN money and look this up. Those no numbers are really off. Um, I will just tell you that. Um, so, I would say pay scale is actually like a company that literally goes off of salary data that they collect from companies and organizations and like people saw and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I would say those. And I'm pretty sure that's a free, pay scale is a free resource, mm -hmm. I think, I believe so. So, I would say that. And then if you, cross-reference that with Glassdoor and those types of things. Um, but it's a, uh, I found pay scale to be a little bit more accurate for yeah. when I'm working with students, but it's always a little bit of a crapshoot because you could think you're worth one thing and they think you're worth another thing. So I usually tell people to say, hey, I'm looking, I give them, if you're not sure, give a wide range. And then just say, but I'm flexible and I'd like to learn more about the responsibilities of the role. Usually companies are pretty okay with that. Don't, don't give me a range like 70 to 150. <laughs> <laughs> like 70 to 90. 20 to 30 is usually an okay range. <laughs> <laughs> you to make sure you're comfortable with the bottom of your range because I know as a recruiter, sometimes companies, if I say like, well, it's 80 to 90, I'm probably not going to 80, knowing that they'll negotiate and then say, well, I'm going to negotiate up and then can't exactly you're happy. But if you say 70 to 90, but you're really only okay with 80, it's 
they then offer you 70, you're kind of, you already said that that was okay with you, so you have to be careful. And, I also have some reports Don't be afraid to negotiate no matter what they come back with. And not just salary. You can negotiate time off, negotiate uh, working from home. Uh, any, I negotiated in two weeks of paternity with my last role. So negotiate anything and, and get what you need out of the role, especially if, if you're providing enough value to that company. I'm going to keep one thing in mind. You do have to work with these people who have accepted. <laughs> so, um, don't be dogged in your negotiations. Uh, I would say that's where the communication thing comes in. You can set up a negotiation call. Um, I would not recommend emailing with all of your requests because it can make you look really creepy. You know, anytime sends you somebody sends you, you know, an email or a text, you're like, <laughs> you know, you, didn't, you take it the wrong way. You don't want the company to take it that way. You don't want them because they can always take the offer away. They can decide that they didn't like how you were during the negotiations or how you came back and blindsided them with wanting 20k more than. And they offered or something, and they can take it away. Um, so it's always good to keep that keep that in mind. Um, but I do recommend doing negotiations over the phone. Um, it's always a good idea too to follow up with what you discussed in an email, saying thank you so much for your time. Thank you for discussing these following things with me. This is how I understood what we discussed. You can do that if you're worried about having things in writing, but um, more often than not, they are good. Provide documentation if you can too. Yeah. So have a printout or a pay scale and say this is what I'm judging it based off of and that way there's there's some data to back up why you're asking for what you want. And that helps the recruiter because sometimes they don't always have stuff to go to their boss with and their boss is you know worried about their budget. So. And by the way so like Glassdoor the salaries are way out of whack by the way so you should, you should literally <laughs> never believe the numbers on Glassdoor but the reviews are amazing. The reviews do tell you the culture so true for a company. Look at the five stars, look at the one stars, look at both. Obviously, take five and ones with grains of salt. Maybe sometimes the twos and threes are better, but it's, it's good to look at that. Also, the class store, make sure you're looking at where these people are coming from within the company. Um, mm -hmm. I usually tell people if you're looking at all the customer service, like call center reviews for a company and not the engineering <laughs> team, you know, those are normally high volume, high turnover type jobs where people usually use it as kind of a filler job. You know, it's not something they want to be in for a long time. So it's one of those things where you do want to make sure, okay, are these engineering reviews? Are these the, you know, the technical team reviews? Because sometimes um, those can even be separate buildings and separate locations. So it's always good to take that into account too. Also, if you do read negative reviews, but you still want to talk to the company, it's okay to bring it up with the recruiter, but in, in a nice way, in a nice way. But if you can say, hey, you know, I read some negative reviews about this, can you speak to it? Um, and that's totally okay to do. Um, I'm sure they'd rather be able to, to speak to you about it than you just discount that because and the way I love to play with that is also like, um, you know, how does your company encounter technical challenges with remote teams if they talk about that? So like you're like, just, oh yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good to spin it into a question. Okay, yeah, sorry. Sure. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Science 
So um, I personally treat it, but I treat all boot camps equivalent. Now generally, whether, um, I try to level the playing field. So it's like, let me get you in the door. You know, you went to one of the top boot camps, but then let's see how you do an interview. Okay, sure. I saw a hand over here earlier. Did you? Um, how many projects is it advisable to post on one specific page in terms of links to projects? So, like the business analytics course is on projects. Is it best to link those in a folder and have like a Google Drive link? Or uh, what, what do you feel is best to be able to I mean, I encourage students just put their kit Yeah. And then in LinkedIn, you can upload media so that there's like a little box. So, even when your summary is rolled up, you can still see the projects. I would just put your most in-depth ones. Um, you can probably speak better to this, but I usually tell students don't figure in the career tracks. Don't don't list all your mini projects um, because a lot of those too are like code where you're learning. <laughs> um, so you want to put your best foot forward when people are going in and looking at it. Because I will tell you, most hiring managers tell me they didn't know their GitHub on your LinkedIn, so I didn't. You know, I had somebody that actually had data say, "Oh yeah, they sent me your LinkedIn." Projects of the week or stuff. You know, so it is really important to get them on um, your capstones as soon as you finish your GitHub. Yeah, and most applications you do nowadays, they do say, oh, can you put your GitHub links? So please do. Now, the business analytics uh, track, I've also mentored that one. I know it's more Excel and Tableau and that track. Um, you can always on GitHub do a gist, which is actually showing you know what you've done and link to the Tableau dashboard that you make public on Tableau and write a markdown and all that as well. Um, but yeah, I would say that GitHub is great for that. And I think speaking specifically to the business analytics course, um, you are you do only need to submit like three for that final review. So maybe talk with your mentor and just truly ask them like which which of the three or maybe the top two do you think I performed the best in or which you know show my skills the best. And I think you know just having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the mentor or even in the community, I think that's a really great way just to see as well. When it comes to your resume, you want to list the projects that are most relevant the job you're applying to. So it could be that you don't use all five um, for every resume, but um, you know, say you have a long form of your resume that has everyone, and then when you're tailoring that one page, kind of like you were saying, that's when you would throw in, you know, the ones that are most relevant to the company that are hitting those skills or the maybe the industry you chose to do the project well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I guess for today, David, what is one thing you would tell your more junior self? So for maybe six months ago. But tell yourself if somebody in a similar position as you, you a year or two back was something. Code every day. I would say when you go uh, to what I would tell myself is when you go into this program or the software, really understand what it is you want to do. Uh, do you want to be the next AI developer or deep learning or, or, or put projects into production and be full staff with, with your data science projects? Or do you want to be more of a, of a business uh, analyst but be able to model business phenomena? So for me, I really didn't know what I wanted, but my, my fit was best for the business analyst side using a lot of the data science models. So um, if I had known that, I may have focused more on some of those business solving projects and a little bit of that. It's not too late to do that, but um, understand better what you think you would be a fit in or what you want to do, and then, and then focus your projects and focus your daily habits on around that. Make sure you have your career coaching call with your first call. We will talk with you about that. And I know I've found a lot of people when they have maybe their second or third mentor call to ask them those questions. Because a lot of the times, even if you haven't thought, I can work through it with you um, and give you pointers, and then you know I'll direct people always to the mentor when it comes to. You know, career, sometimes with the career path, you can specific about their experience. I would say continue to talk to Allison and your mentor about that as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure we spoke about that, and my mentor and I spoke about that, but then we had a little bit of FOMO of what you see going on from Google and Amazon, things like that, and then you get off track again. So continually have that conversation about where you want to go. And I think, Rich, too, speaking to that, I know some of our students are in the introduction or intermediate course with the sales course, and they might not have those career calls yet. So I think another thing you can do is go through the different units. Um, there are a lot of them. There's programming, you know, there's storytelling, there's a lot of different uh, 
components of the course that you might find interesting. So play around with that. I know a lot of the times when I have like calls with my students, they'll say, oh, you know, data wrangling, I'm really struggling with that. Well, that might be that might be your strong suit. So kind of look into the other different components of that specific course and kind of find where you naturally fit in and find where you know, you're naturally excelling. Don't be afraid to reach out. You know, reach out to me, reach out to David. I don't want to speak to David, but I'm sure he's, he's open. Um, and say, hey, I, got, I have these questions. Um, reach out to anyone in, in the professional network and, and help talk through it. Uh, you're not, you don't have to go through this alone. Yeah, that's good. You have a lot of people you can ask questions. <laughs> you can call up someone that you heard on a, on a uh, <laughs> yeah, Let's go right. have coffee with them. Yeah, yeah. on the back of your networking pages today. <laughs> <laughs> You know, where we are in 2018 is the data science industry is growing so fast. You know, I, I only shared one statistic earlier. 6% of machine learning papers came out last month. In 2018, 30% of all, 35% of all machine learning papers that have ever been made were made this year. That's how fast this industry is growing and shifting. Therefore, it's great for you to specialize, and that's why you know Springboard now has the NLP, the advanced machine learning, the AI track, the AI specialization coming on. You know all these unique tracks to help them specialize, and the jobs are no longer just data scientists. There's NL engineer, NLP engineer, AI engineer. All these also could be researchers. They could be applied. There's so many different job titles in this now. So when I see there's 3,000 active jobs in New York for data science, I just with the word data scientist, nothing with AI, nothing with research, nothing with NLP. Um, you know, where would I a couple of years ago think about what I could do sooner? Try what I want to do now. You don't have to wait a year or two to get into this algorithm. Play around with it now. You know, uh, play around with this PyTorch algorithm. Play around with TensorFlow. Try it out. You know, get your hands dirty. Find a tutorial on that. Ask your mentor. They'll put you in the right direction. You know, um, and if the material is not available. On Springboard Data Camp, they'll say, oh, check out this Unity course I love. Check out this Hackett or O'Reilly book that will take you to that next level. So we're here to bridge that gap for you. Great questions. Yeah. We got one time. One more question. One more question. Great. Go ahead. Um, which industries or sectors uh, would you say have been your favorites for the data science uh, field, but also in terms of mentees? Which, which industries have they kind of given you the best feedback on in terms of? Profits or startups, which industry has been kind of everything, <laughs> all the entire industry. Everyone is needing analysts, data scientists, AI people. I mean, it's it's crazy. So, like, right, to, if we paint the picture, so 2012 is when this deep learning phenomenon with you know Google came around, and then we've seen that wave move through 2015. It's reaching critical mass, but it's not going to reach critical mass to like 2020, 2021. AI is just now picking up as well. Like that's going to be reaching critical mass over the next five to ten years. So it's all industries. Everyone's going to need it. So um, everyone's hiring for it. In terms of personal preferences, which I think certain industries, I think they're all great and they're all paying money. Everybody's <laughs> <laughs> different. Yeah, 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 of different. course. And one thing I would say is that, like, kind of the, the realistic thing that should go through your head, especially if you're transitioning is to think about where's my leverage what do i have already like from my domain knowledge or my past experiences that would give me some insight you know that i would already have into this industry so maybe if you're in the nonprofit space you know those are that would be you know a great place to go you already know how they work you know maybe how the financial side which is very different than you know a corporation would be um, maybe some of the regulations things like that so it's always you know don't undersell your past experience we've got to figure out how to use it um, and so a passion is through it. Yeah, yeah. And I think also if you haven't found your passion yet, that's okay too. I think there is a lot of pressure to like, you know, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. You know, that's a lot of pressure. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm still figuring those things out too. And I'm a fruit coach. So, um, you know, but I think that if you're always seeking it, you know, that can still be can still be fulfilling as well. So. So I think it's just following what's interested interests mm -hmm. you. I usually tell students don't look at the job titles. Look at what projects am I going to work on, and am I going to get to use the technologies that I want to grow in? And that a lot of times is going to help you find opportunities that you'll find fulfilling, and without obsessing about some of the things that you may not have control over, and honestly are extremely inconsistent because I usually say data scientist titles are like snowflakes, not one is alike, um, because every company has a different. And the interests are so important. I'm going to give two case studies of a student who I worked with and one who I'm currently working with. 
One of them in the Boston area is so fascinated around basketball. That person had a basketball podcast. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and um, really was interested. And I say, you should two different industries, but they were so gung ho on basketball that we did two capstones on it. They wanted to work there. They said either the NBA or DraftKings. It's the only two companies that want to work there. <laughs> and we got them, you know, interviews in both, and they ultimately got a job at DraftKings. But since day one, we were preparing for it. And I even knew some of the draft teams. I know like their head of strategy, so like we connected and just made it easy. So if you know, all your mentors are here to help you on that journey and to prepare you there for day one if you know. And if you don't, I generally recommend two different industries for your capstones so you have that um, experience. The current student I'm working with loves esports and the whole esports phenomena, and they're in Charlotte in the Research Triangle. And I told them, did you know Epic Games is there? And they said, no, I didn't, but they don't do esports. And I said, Yes, they do. They're giving out $100 million in esports this year. We're going to prepare you to work for Epic Games. So I said, unless you want to move to Vegas, Malta, or the Netherlands. He says, <laughs> says Charlotte sounds quite good. So we're working on that story narrative for two esports gaming capstones. One's on League of Legends right now, the other one will be another one, and I'm sure they will get that job. Thank you. All right, well, um, if you guys have any questions that we have not been able to answer today or anyone watching Facebook Live, Feel free to email Chris or I at support at springboard.com or Molly or Chris at springboard.com and we'd be more than happy to relay those questions to either our community or we can bring it up in our office hours next week. Um, but just wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists for joining us.